All right, so we're going to be, I've got two sermons today. We're going to be kind of wrapping up the year. Tonight I'm going to be preaching more on wrapping up the year and what we're going to be looking at next year. But this morning I wanted to preach specifically. And um, if you're familiar with, if you followed my preaching at all, Word of Truth, there is some things that I did over there that I want to do over here as well. And those are the challenges that we would do throughout the year. And we're going to start off in 2019, in the month of January, doing a Bible reading challenge. And the challenges are designed to push you a little bit further. And, it, and it's, we're going to be focusing on different things, different aspects of the Christian life to help you grow a little bit more, hopefully to develop new habits and better habits and just to push yourself a little bit more. We don't ever want to get to the point where we're just real comfortable and kind of coasting through our life spiritually and just we're kind of on autopilot and yeah, you're going to church, you're doing some, you know, we, we want to try to push and exceed and do a little bit more. We always want to make it just a little bit uncomfortable to, to do more. So what we're doing in January, and hopefully we get everyone to participate in this, is we're doing a Bible reading challenge. And the Bible reading challenge is to read the entire New Testament in the month of January. So we've got 31 days to read all of the New Testament. Now, a lot of people, oftentimes at New Year's, you'll make New Year's resolutions, and a lot of times Christians will be like, well, I want to read the Bible, you know, cover to cover this year. And I think that's a great plan to have that. I think, you know, we, we should set goals like that for ourselves. And we're, I'm going to get into a little bit more of that tonight. But when it comes to reading the Bible, what a better start than just getting the whole New Testament knocked out. Get about a fourth of the Bible, a third or fourth of the Bible just, just done completely within the first month. And that'll give you momentum going into the rest of the year. Now, um, I know we have people here. This might not be that much of a challenge for you. Or you might be on another plan. If you're on a plan that, that you're reading a lot of the Bible anyways, and maybe you, your plan isn't working the way that, that this is going to fit into it very well, um, I'm going to offer up, because what we're going to do is, similar to our Bible memory, we give prizes out for anyone that completes these challenges. And one exception I'm going to make, because the, the, the plan is to read the entire New Testament within the month of January. But if you open up your Bible and you figure out how many pages are in the New Testament, if you're somewhere else in the Bible, let's say you're in the Old Testament somewhere, you're doing a different reading plan, if you read that number of pages within all of January, I'll say that you completed our challenge, okay? Because what it, roughly what it's going to amount to, if you can do eight chapters a day in the New Testament, that should leave you, I, I, I did the math last year, I didn't, I didn't do the math this year, it should leave you with one or two days of being allowed to miss doing the reading or doing that much reading. So you kind of got a little bit of a buffer, but if you could kind of stay on course and making sure you read those eight chapters, then you should be good. Now, obviously some chapters are longer than others. So if you don't want to do it by chapter, you can just look, you know, calculate in your Bible with your font and everything else, how many pages is the New Testament and divide that by 31 or by 30 or 29. If you want to give yourselves a couple extra days, just as a buffer to give yourself that, then that's how you do it. And you calculate, this is how many pages I need to read, and then make sure you're reading those pages. And that'll, that'll make sure the, the amount of time you have to spend reading is consistent all the way through. Because in the Gospels, you've got chapters that are 50 verses, 60 verses. You know, Gospel of Mark is a pretty big book, but it's only 16 chapters. So those chapters are pretty long, right? But... Um, so that's why, I mean, if you do eight, but you can still do the eight chapters and some days you might have a little bit more, some days you may have a little bit less reading and that'll get you through. So however you want to divide it up is up to you. But the goal is to, so, and that, and that gives you a rough idea because, you know, typically like we do a, a family Bible reading plan every day. It's four chapters of the Bible. So as a, as a family, I sit down and I read to my family and we go through, because that way that ensures you're getting through the Bible at least one time. You get through it a little bit sooner. Uh, we go through a little bit sooner because when we get to Psalms, we, we read way more than four chapters 
on those days because some of the Psalms only have like three verses or something. So we're, we'll plow through a whole bunch of them in one sitting. But that's, that's our personal plan that we do. And that way I make sure my kids are hearing the Bible at least one time every single year. And then, of course, we're able to have our own personal Bible reading and things like that. But that's something we do. But four chapters, that's only like, takes us about 20 minutes for me reading out loud to my family to do that 20, 25 minutes. If you're reading just on your own, you could read a lot faster than, than verbally saying all the words out loud and just reading like that. So it's really not that much. I mean, when you think about it, it may be more, hopefully it's more, well, hopefully it's not more than what you're doing right now. I don't know if it's, if it's, if it's um, not more than what you're doing right now, figure out a challenge for yourself and, and get in the spirit of this thing of what your goal is. Maybe you've got, you've got, you know, plenty of free time and you've already been doing, say, Pastor Burzins, I already read at least eight chapters a day. Amen. I, I praise the Lord. I, that's great. Try to push yourself to do a little bit more. If you're already doing eight, try to do 10, try to do 12 or something, you know, just, just to push yourself to do a little bit more. And if you're not currently doing that much Bible reading, then stick, get with the challenge. Do this, get the whole New Testament knocked out. Now, I gave that caveat of, you know, if you already have your solid reading plan, I'm okay with that. But there's something good about getting like an entire, you get the whole New Testament done. It's going to be motivating. It's, it it, it kind of has a different impact when you go into it saying, you know, I read it just in one month. I read the entire New Testament. And that's a great accomplishment to have finished. So uh, that is the goal and that is the challenge. And what I'm going to be preaching about this morning is now why is Bible reading just in general so important? And why are we pushing for this? And why do I strive for this? You know, a lot of people might think, many people out there, you know, when you go out sowing, you talk to people like this, oh, I already read the Bible. Right? People will say, well, I've, I, I've already done that. Now, oftentimes, I think that's a lie anyway <laughs> when people say it because there's a lot of people say it. When they say they've read the Bible, it means they've read like a couple pages or a couple chapters and then they've sat in church and just heard teaching on the Bible, right? Very few people actually read the entire book cover to cover. But even for those that do, even for people who do read the entire book, you've read the whole thing cover to cover. This is not like a novel. This is not like some other book. They have to read for English class or you just read for enjoyment on your own time and just reading literature where you could just read a book and be like, wow, that was a good book and you put it aside. This is the word of God. I mean, it's not a book that you just read one time and say, well, that's it. I don't need to read this or look at this anymore because I've already read it. And if you think you know everything that's in the Bible because you read it one time, you're sorely mistaken. You could read this book every single day of your life and still not know everything that's in this book because it's that deep, because it's powerful, because it's the Word of God. And we're treating it as such. And this is a book that we need to live our lives by. This is something that you need to know on a regular basis to make decisions in your life, to go through life, to know what's right, to know what's wrong. This is not something you just read one time and just be like, yep, I got it. We're good. This is our life. We're going to get into some of those points a little bit, but we started off here in 2 Timothy chapter 3. There is a lot of things we could preach on 2 Timothy 3, so I'm going to try to keep it focused in on our subject at hand here. Look down at verse number 14. Because this is the Apostle Paul writing this epistle to Timothy. Timothy was a young preacher, and Paul was giving him guidance and instruction on how we ought to live and how we ought to be. Verse number 14 says, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned, and has been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. And I just want to make this point real quickly. Neither coming to church and hearing the Bible preached is sufficient, nor just reading the Bible is sufficient in your spiritual life, in your walk with God. We need both. You need to hear God's word preached. You need to hear it expounded upon. You need to, you need to be in the church. You need to, to be here to fellowship with one another, but also to hear and to learn and receive teaching from someone else that's going to that's gonna teach you things. Just as the Apostle Paul is, is, is advising Timothy here, hey, remember the things you've learned and it's been assured of knowing of whom thou hast learned them. He's been taught certain things. The Apostle Paul taught Timothy certain things. And he's, and he's taught him things. He's saying, don't forget these things. 
And that's an admonishment. It's not just here in this book, in this book of the Bible, this verse. There's other places too where he's saying, hey, you know, don't forget the things that we've taught you. This teaching is important. The hearing, the preaching is important. But also, you know, reading the Bible for yourself, you need to be doing that. Everyone needs to be doing that. That's the only way you're going to understand if what you're even hearing is true. If you can believe what's being taught to you. Now, a good preacher, if you're in a good church, you should be hearing things that's going to open up your understanding a little bit better and understand the Bible a little bit more. And there's going to be, uh, you know, God's words going to be prepared and presented and a lot of cross references made already for you to open up and see, wow, yeah, I didn't understand that. I've read that before, but I didn't quite get that. That's what you're going to get in church. But on your own time and your own reading, you also need to be doing that because there is other learning and other growing. And that honestly, that should be the majority of your learning and teaching should be coming from your own individual Bible reading. That should be the bulk of it. You should be seeing things for yourself and learning from your own reading and your own hearing from the word of God. Let's keep reading here. Look at verse number 15. It says, And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. And this is a point that he's, he's saying, you know, Timothy was brought up hearing the Bible. From a child, he's heard the, the, the Holy Scriptures. And this, this goes back to what I was suggesting about, this is one of the reasons why I read the Bible as a father in my household, to my children, to my family. I want to make sure my kids know the Bible. It's not just enough for me to go home and say, well, I'm the pastor of the church, so they have to hear me preach on the Bible anyways when they come to church. That's not good enough. That's not good enough for your kids. That's not good enough for my kids. They need to be hearing this. As Timothy says, from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures. I want them to know the Bible. I want them just to have heard it. I want them to know the Holy Scriptures. Why? Because they're able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. I need to make sure, I want to make sure, I love my kids. I want to make sure every single one of my kids is saved and on their way to heaven. And the more they hear and the more they know about the Bible, the more likely they are to receive that wisdom about being saved. And we start them from a young age and we go all the way through their life. And obviously though, hearing the Bible isn't just about being saved. That's the most important thing. But it has all the other instructions for life in general. And they need to hear that. And I want my kids to hear that from a young age, from their youth, that as they grow older, they're going to know right from wrong. They're not going to have to wonder about, is this right? Is this wrong? So that way, when they're confronted or when they're tempted or when they have something, they could at least know what the right answer is and hopefully be strong enough to choose the right answer. But I don't want them ignorant. I don't want them sinning through ignorance. I don't want them just to not know and end up making these mistakes in their life that so many people make just because they haven't heard, they haven't been taught, they haven't been trained knowing that, hey, it's not good, you know, it's not good to, to even get started drinking alcohol. It's not, being a social drinker is not okay. Look not thou upon the wine when it's red, when it, when it giveth its color in a cup with it, moveth itself aright. At the last, it, it biteth like a serpent, stingeth like, like an adder. And you can go through all Proverbs 23 and, and, and read all of the, the horrible effects of drinking alcohol and, and how we're admonished and warned. Don't even look at it. Don't even take that sip. Don't, don't go and have a drink. It's not okay. It's not good for you. Avoiding things like there's so many others. I'm not going to go through all the lists because I want to focus just on reading the scriptures. But that's where we get the wisdom from. That's what we're going to understand and we're going to learn to not even end up going down that path. Because how many people, and with that one example of drinking, how many people started off just having a drink or two or going out with friends? Oh, we're going to go out and just have a good time. We're going to go out and have some drinks after work. We're going to go out and do this. And people just go along because they don't think it's a big deal because so many people are out doing it. And how many of the drunks today, how many of the people that have committed adultery, how many of the people that have gotten into even worse and other sins, it all started and went down that path from when they started having those first few drinks. Now, just because you might have some people that exist that, that have had some drinks and they never got into major sin, 
that doesn't mean that, that just because those people exist, that, that we're gonna teach that you should even get involved with that from the beginning because all the people that have all the problems started with just one drink. Started some, everyone has to start somewhere. And that's a dangerous game to play and we don't even wanna go down that path at all. So here the Apostle Paul is, is reminding Timothy, he said, hey, from a child you've known the Holy Scriptures which are able to make thee wise into salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. And then verse 16, all Scripture, Scripture is the Word of God, it's the written Word of God. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. This is why it's so important to be reading your Bible, not just reading your Bible, but daily reading your Bible. I mean, every single day of your life, you should not go one day without reading the Bible. Now, you decide how much you ought to be reading every day for yourself. I mean, that's up to you. The, the Bible doesn't tell us, God doesn't tell us a specific number, a specific amount of time, a specific, you know, he, he doesn't give us that information. That's left up to us. But he does tell us, you know, Jesus quoted the Old Testament. He said, man doth not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. That, hey, it's not just that physical bread that you need to live and to survive. And, you, and he's comparing it to eating food. You, if you eat food, I mean, think about it. How, how often do you need to eat food? I mean, we pretty much eat food every day. Yeah, you could fast. Yeah, you could get by a couple of days or whatever without eating. And in extreme events, if you're fasting for a long time, maybe you could go 30 days without eating. But at some point, you're going to die. Your life is just going to stop. And he's equating living by the Word of God, receiving the Word of God with just eating food and living by bread. By bread. Well, we don't need bread alone. We need the Word of God. So... How often do you eat? Typically, people eat about three times a day. Well, you know what? That tells me we probably need to be receiving the Word of God about three times a day. To have a healthy spiritual diet, we ought to be receiving about that much. And, uh, and think about this, too. So there, there's so much truth and wisdom here. Yes, we're going to do a big push to try to get a lot of reading done. But also, don't forget, the, the whole point of reading isn't just to get see how fast you can get through it to get that amount done, because you need to have the understanding also. So what I'm saying to push yourselves, I'm not saying if you normally read three or four chapters a day, I'm not saying try to get eight chapters in that same amount of time. <laughs> That's not the point. Because you won't learn anything from doing it and that's not the point of the exercise the point is to dedicate more time to this so one of the ways to do this and accomplish this goal is to not do it all in one sitting that would be like if you were to sit down and say well i'm going to get all three of my meals for the day in at once right so i'm going to go to the buffet all you can eat I'm going to sit down and let's see, I normally take about 30 minutes, 45 minutes to eat. So I'm going to go and spend a couple hours and I'm just going to eat and get all my food in for the day. And then I'm going to go out and I don't have to worry about having any more meals. That doesn't make sense. I mean, that's why you couldn't do that for the, I mean, you wouldn't do that for the day, but how about for the year or for the month, right? We don't want to get to have that same type of mentality with the Bible either. And here's why, because Anyone who's read your Bible for an extended period of time will know that at some point you're going to stop being able to really absorb what you're reading. I mean, it's a heavy book. It requires your attention and your focus. And you may be able to dedicate a lar large portion of time to reading the scriptures, and that's great. Praise the Lord for that. But just make sure that when you're reading, it's profitable. It's good for you. I've, I've been listening to the Bible on audio in my car for a long, I mean, I don't even know how many years at this point, probably about 12 years or 15 years or something like that. I don't even, I don't remember exactly when I started doing that. But even listening to the Bible, I go on long trips and stuff, I get to a point to where I just turn it off because I'm, I'm not able to really get any more. And that's, that's listening's easier. 
reading the Bible takes even more focus and more attention. And, and you get, I think you get more out of reading, but um, I'm not going to get into all the audio versus reading. But at some point, you're going to need to just, you know, you're going to hit a limit. That's why it's also important to say, okay, well, I'm going to get this much in, so I'm going to spread it out throughout the day. You start off with maybe a couple chapters in the morning, two, three chapters when you wake up. That's a good time to read the Bible. Take a break somewhere in the middle of the day. Read a few more chapters. Get that good reading in. And then in the evening, read a few more. You know, maybe, maybe you read a little bit more in the evening than you do in the morning or whatever, right? Maybe you got a little bit more time in the morning. Than you, you, that's fine. Adjust it for your schedule, but just make sure that what, the time that you're using is being well spent and that you're going to be learning and receiving as much as you possibly can. Because the more, if you just sit down and try to get the whole chunk done at once, it's not going to be as profitable for you as splitting it up throughout the day. And then, you, on top of that, you have the added bonus when you split it up of being mindful of the things that are in the Bible throughout the day, right? Because think about it, if you only read at night, you read right before you go to bed. That's not that much time to really let the word kind of sink in and, and even consider God's word. You, could, you, can, you, know, you could still be doing your Bible reading and, and look, if that's the only time you have to read, then keep, just read. You know, make sure you're reading the Bible. That's the number one most important thing. But I'm trying to, to explain a better way, right? That if you just read at night right before you go to bed, it doesn't give you that much time. And then by the time you sleep and you wake up, you're, not gonna necessarily, you're, you're probably not going to be thinking about the things of God right from the, the moment you wake up. I don't know about, I mean, I typically am thinking about my day and what things I need to do, and I got to do this, and I got to do that, and you, know, you kind of get distracted already with oftentimes just with the cares of the world, the things you got to do, whatever, go to work, do everything else. But if you can put in there time, just make it work, make it fit, whether you have to get up a little bit earlier or leave a little bit later or whatever you have to do, say, well, you know what? I'm going to start off my day with what's really important, with that manna with that word of God, and I'm going to listen to God first. I'm going to hear from God before I start my day. I'm going to get in, even if it's just a couple chapters. Like I said, get those couple chapters in because then as you're getting ready and thinking about other things, you can also be, you know, spinning around in your head what you've just read and then go through your day. And then as you get busy and distracted doing everything else, you could take a moment and say, well, wait a minute, hold on, I'm going to take a, take a break here, I'm going to stop. Maybe it's your lunch hour or something like that. I'm going to stop, I'm going to get some more feeding from God. I'm going to receive a little bit more of his word and then continue on and then do some more at night. I think that's probably the best plan to have. And if you're going to make this goal, that's going to be the easiest way to do it and probably the best way to do it is split it up, get some reading in at different intervals and get it done. And then you'll realize, wow, that really isn't even that all, all that difficult anyways. The hard part is changing your habits and changing your schedule just to make it work. So invest time in this. We've got a couple days before we start. You know, January 1st is a new year. So that's when we're starting this, this, this goal, this plan. And take the time to think about it. Seriously, ponder it. What am I going to do different? How am I going to make this work? Because the other, the other problem with leaving it all to the end of the day is that Sometimes you get real busy in the day and now it's like, oh, well, I need to go to bed because I got to get up early tomorrow. Then you're stuck with making a decision. Well, I'm just going to stay up even later and, and get it done. But then and that's going to impact, that's going to have its, its own repercussions. So making sure you at least get things knocked out early is always better, making sure you get that done. So that's just a little bit more advice. But the Bible says here in verse 16, again, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. This is why it's so important, because it's God's word. It's not just man's word. We don't receive it as man's words, but it's the word of God. And it's profitable for us. It's profitable. It's good for us for doctrine, to understand what's right and what's wrong from the word of God, for correction, when we're doing things wrong, to lead us in the right way, for instruction, to tell us what to do, and, um, and for reproof, I missed, I missed reproof, correction are, are pretty much the same thing. Telling you when you're doing wrong, correcting the problem that you're doing, and giving you the right ways. That the man of God may be perfect, 
truly furnished unto all good works. God wants us to be perfect. He wants us to be complete. He wants us doing right. He doesn't want us sinning. He wants us to have this instruction. That's what he wants for us. He doesn't just want for you to be saved and then, okay, well, just you're on vacation, live the rest of your life until you go to heaven. No, he, he, he started a good work in you when he's given you the Holy Spirit. When that new man was born inside of you, the new spirit is born again. That started a work. That work will be completed at the resurrection when we get our new bodies. But up until that point, he wants us working. He's, 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 uh, he's built us unto, uh, you know, we're his workmanship unto good works. In Ephesians 2 verse 10, the Bible explains that. Verses 8 and 9 tell us that it's just by faith that we're saved, just by God's grace. By grace, through faith, we're saved. No works, has nothing to do with ourselves. But the reason why he saved us, what he wants us to do is we're his workmanship. He wants us to do good works. We've been created under good works. He wants us to do more. And we're going to receive that by reading the Bible and knowing more what he has for us to do and what he doesn't want us to do. So reading the Bible is key. Now, we're going to look at some, turn if you would to Matthew 21. We're going to see some places in the Bible where Jesus is rebuking people for not reading. It happens a few times for sure. Now, Matthew 21, look at verse number 42. The Bible says, Jesus saith unto them, did ye never read in the scriptures? So right away, he's just asking a question. Well, didn't you read? Didn't you ever read this? You know, they come to Jesus with questions or they're, or they're you know, spouting off their false doctrines. And he's just like, how can you believe that? How can you even ask about this? Didn't you read the scriptures? And that's the number one thing that's a problem with so many people. You know, and so many scholarly types, the, the, the James Whites and the Durpins and, the, you know, these people that want to be all sound real intellectual and, and throw out all the big theological terms and they, they tout their degrees at seminary and all this other stuff and, and they want to sound really intelligent and really smart. You know what the problem is? They're just not reading the Bible. And when they are reading the Bible, they're not believing it because they're relying on their own knowledge and their own wisdom of the world. And, oh, I know Greek, and I know that. Why don't you just learn to understand English? Just, just read the Bible for what it says. You know, God's given us scripture in English. Just, just understand the language. And um, they want to go off and think they could get, glean these extra meanings, and they really know what the Bible says. It's a bunch of nonsense. But, and they have so many false doctrines, like, didn't you read this? Look at uh, verse number 42. Bible says, Jesus said unto them, did you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected, the same as become the head of the corner? This is the Lord's doing and is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore say I unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. And when you talk to people, these dispensationalists and, and these people who um, don't believe in what, what we believe in is called replacement theology. It doesn't matter what the, what the name is for it. But these people who don't want to believe that God has stopped using Israel. He's taken away their part. That Jesus came unto his own and his own received him not. That the Jews aren't some special people. They're not just still God's chosen people and they've got a free pass into heaven or, or somehow it matters that they're physically the seed of Abraham. When people just, just go off and teach and preach this stuff, it's like, have you not read? Have you not read? Jesus said to someone else, hey, have you not read? The kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. Do you think the Jews are bringing forth the fruits of the Holy Bible as they reject Jesus Christ to this day? No. He's taken the kingdom from them. He's given it unto another nation. People who are doing the works, people who are producing fruit, people who are actually saved, people who actually receive Jesus Christ and then are going around and recruiting other people and proselytizing and bringing forth much fruit. Amen. Haven't you read that? 
That's a simple doctrine. And the way that Jesus explains all of these things when he's given rebukes, turn to chapter 22, he just, it's, like, it's like it should be so easy. And it would be so easy if you just read the word of God. Just read it and believe what it says. You don't need a man to, to have to, if you need someone, I'll put it this way, if you need someone to have to go through, jump through all these different hoops to try to explain some supposed truth from the Bible, it's probably a lie. It's probably a lie because the word of God is not that difficult. It's written in a way so that we could understand it. Now, I'm not saying there aren't things that you need to hear and be taught to understand. And, and let, me, let me make sure I'm very clear about that. Because there's sometimes when you read the Bible that you're not quite getting what the Bible says. And you just need to hear someone explain it because they already have understood and been taught and learned what that means. But so many times when it comes to just, just doctrines or whatever, I know in my going to church, hearing Bible preaching, every time I learn something I didn't know before, I look at the Bible and go, oh, it's right there. How could I have missed that? And that's when you know it's true because it's just plain as day on the face of the page. It's just right there. And you think like, wow, I've read this, you know, 10 times. How could I have missed that? But it's still right there. When you hear good preaching and good teaching, you learn something new. That's the way it ought to be. When you have to start building charts and, and no, 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 okay, wait. Right here, we're going to piece all of this stuff together to try to prop up some teaching that you would never get just from reading the Bible. Then, you, then you've got a false doctrine. You've got something that just isn't there. Because nothing should require that, you know, some great level of difficulty to try to piecemeal everything together. Now, if you're comparing just spiritual to spiritual, you say, oh, okay, we've got this uh, story over here, we've got this teaching over here, and you make them fit together, that's not what I'm talking about when you have these, you know, again, that should still be evident. You can read and be like, oh, okay, this is what this is teaching, this is what this is teaching. They fit together. No big deal. But when you're trying to, to take things out of context and try to preach doctrines that just just not clear at all, that's when you know you got false doctrine, like the, the pre-tribulational rapture and things like that. There's no way you can just come to those conclusions just by reading. You need to have all these other things built up and established in these different foundations of, oh, no, 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 see, when, when, when Matthew 24 is, 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 when Jesus is preaching there, he's talking to the Jews. See, the Jews are different people. You have to understand what elect means. Elect doesn't mean that they're just chosen and it's, and it's not, you know, no, they're special people. And when he says, have you not read the kingdom of God shall be taken from you, given to a nation, bring forth the fruits thereof, you know, don't worry about that. That still doesn't impact the Jews because this is still only taught, you know, and they go through all of these different ways of explaining away clear scripture. You've got a false doctrine. Matthew 22 is the next place we're going to see here Jesus giving another rebuke for not knowing the Bible, for not reading, for not having just read on your own. Verse number 29, Matthew 22, 29, Jesus answered and said to them, you do err, you're in error, you're wrong, not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. For in the resurrection, thy ni they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. This is people, the, the Sadducees, that didn't believe in the resurrection. And they're trying to ask him questions. Well, and they come up with this whole story of, there's this guy that married a woman. And they didn't have any kids together. And the man died. And he had all these brothers, right? There's seven brothers. They all end up marrying her because they all keep dying. None of them have any kids. And he's just like, so, in the resurrection, well, who's... Whose wife is she going to be? I mean, all seven were married to her. And Jesus is like, haven't you read the Bible? You're in error. You're wrong. The question is stupid. And notice there's, there's people that feared. After Jesus gives them these answers and he's just like, didn't you just read the scripture? You'll oftentimes see, and, and they durst not ask him anything more. And even his own disciples sometimes were afraid to ask Jesus questions. I get sick of hearing people say this. You know, people have slandered Pastor Anderson. They, people slander Pastor Anderson all the time. 
And you hear these heretics that have come out and they try to slander him and say, oh, no one can ever ask him a question because he's so unapproachable. You know, it's like, first of all, that's not true. But second of all, the reason why they feel that way is because they come, they've come to him with, with questions that are just like, haven't you read the Bible at all? Like these Sadducees have. And it's always the false prophets that are the one that are bringing these accusations. Oh, you can't ever approach him. He's all just... You know. I've never had a problem asking him a question. So many other people have never had any problems asking questions. But when you have an idiot who's not even saved coming up and bringing up stupid questions like this, you know what? Yeah, sometimes it, it, you are going to get the response, hey, haven't you read? I mean, do you, do you really not know this? And then some people, maybe they don't want to ask, but you know what? That's how Jesus was. And you can read the Bible. You'll see that people, they were afraid to ask him questions sometimes based on his answers. Was Jesus in sin? Did, he have, did, did Jesus have the wrong spirit? Oh, no, you can't be like that. You don't want to make yourself unapproachable. Well, you know what? Jesus made himself unapproachable sometimes. But it's always for good reason. Always for good reason. That's a little side point. But um, <laughs> here he's saying, you know, they, they have this, this screwed up idea of the resurrection. And he's saying, for in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are the angels of God in heaven. And this is what I would say to those people who believe in this, this hybrid mix, the Nephilim of the, you know, the angels are the sons of God and they came to this earth and they, they married these, these women and they made it and they had children and now you've got this intermingling of, of angel seed and human seed and then you get these huge giants and all this. Haven't you read? I mean, it's basically the same, the same answer that Jesus has given these guys. Hey, the angel, they're like the angels in heaven. What are the angels in heaven? They don't marry nor are given in marriage. So in the resurrection, we're going to be like the angels. We're not going to be going and trying to find some woman to get married. No, there's going to be no marriage. As we explained in here, it doesn't matter that she was married to seven guys, seven brothers, because in the resurrection, there is no marriage. You're not going to be married to anyone. You know, when you get married on this earth, first of all, just listen to the vows. It's till death do us part. Guess what? <laughs> Those men died. They're not married anymore. By, even by the law, I mean, they're just not, it's no longer a marriage at that point. So in the resurrection, you're not, you're, you're not married. And there is no marriage in the resurrection. The Bible says in Jesus Christ, there's neither male nor female, neither Jew nor Greek. That, the things that we understand and know today and the way that we live in this, you know, between marriages and families and things like that, that's not the way things are going to operate in the resurrection. It's not the way it is. We're going to have a different body, a glorified body. Now, I, don't, I can't tell you exactly, exactly how everything will be because all we know is what God has told us. That's all we need to know. But I know that we're all brothers and sisters in Christ. And I know, you know, as, as born-again believers, when we get to heaven especially and we just have the new man and the, and the new flesh, that it's going to be like one, one family in heaven and and the man the woman the, the different things that are in place husbands wives all of that stuff is it's not going to matter in heaven it's not the same structure and jesus is saying this is basic the reason why he's rebuking these people is because these are basic truths he's saying you should just get this stuff by reading haven't you read haven't you just read what the scripture says this isn't some super deep subject or, so, or, or something that's like Oh, I understand why you don't know this because this, this just, man, I, I need to teach you this stuff. Oh, but no, he says, no, haven't you read? You do err not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. And he says in verse 31, but it's touching the resurrection of the dead. Have you not read? So he says again, have you not read that which was spoken unto you by God saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. He said, didn't you... How often do you read that in the Bible? I'm the God of, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's, that's more than one time in the Bible. I mean, that's kind of, you see that quite a bit in the Old Testament. He said, haven't you even read that? It's a pretty simple verse. He's the God of the living, not the God of the dead. 
Turn to Romans chapter 4. Simple truths. But this is how you're going to know the simple truths, the basics. You're not going to know all the truth, but, but especially these basic truths. You need to read the Bible. You need to be reading the Scripture. And before you go asking dumb questions, because a lot of these are just dumb questions and, and these foolish thoughts and Jewish fables and, and whatever, just start by reading the Bible. Then you won't have to hear from Jesus. Haven't you read? I mean, have you not read? And don't forget, too, that these are people that were supposed to have read and known the script. I mean, he's talking to Sad. It's not, this isn't, he's not talking to someone who just got saved yesterday. This isn't talking to just some, some random person on the street. The way he's, he's approaching these people and talking to them, these are the Pharisees and the Sadducees that are supposed to be the great Bible scholars. This is the James Whites and the, you know, all the, the false prophets of today. Hey, haven't you read? I mean, you're supposed to be a Bible teacher and Bible scholar. Haven't you even read this much? Romans 4, verse number 1, the Bible says, What shall we say then that Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath were of the glory, but not before God. And this is for the people who say, Oh no, people were saved. In the Old Testament, people were saved by their works. Now we're in the dispensation of grace. Now we have a different gospel than the gospel. Had been, you, know, you know what? If people preach another gospel, let them be accursed. Amen. And I don't care if they say, oh, no, but at this time we're in this gospel and it's the right gospel. Look, you're preaching there's another gospel. There's only one gospel. You'd be accursed when you say there's other gospels. What shall we say that Abraham our father is pertaining to the flesh hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, but wasn't he in the Old Testament? That was, he wasn't in the dispensation of grace. If Abraham were justified by works, he hath were of the glory. If he's justified by his own works, he can glory about that. He can say, look how good I am. Look at everything I've done. But not before God. Verse 3, for what saith the Scripture? Well, how are we going to know about Abraham? How do we know about how he was saved? How are we going to know about any of this stuff? Well, what does the Bible say? What saith the scripture? Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. It doesn't say in the Bible, Abraham worked real hard and did all these good things and that was accounted to him for righteousness. What does the Bible say? Scripture says Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. And if you keep reading through Romans 4, He's going to then go ahead and quote also Psalms. You say, well, even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. Quoting Scripture. Paul's writing this epistle to the Romans. He's teaching them simple truths by referring to Scriptures. I mean, read through the book of Romans. How many times is he quoting other Scriptures? I mean, over and over and over. The Bible says, the Scripture has said. He's teaching them and showing them from Scripture basic truths. I mean, the, Rome, the Epistle of Romans, this is one of the reasons why you have the Romans road, right? Because there's so many verses, there's so many passages in this epistle that teach really, really fundamental basic truths, basic doctrines. And all throughout this book, you're going to see him teaching by referring to the Scriptures, you're going to understand the Bible and understand the scriptures by reading, by reading the scriptures. This is where he's getting the information to teach it from. It's coming directly from the source, from the scriptures. If you're going to be successful in not only understanding these truths of the Bible, but also being able to persuade others, you need to know the scriptures. You need to know it for yourself. The apostle Paul knew the scriptures enough to be able to teach other people so. And if you're going to want to be able to teach other people, I mean, even through soul winning, right? You need to know where to go. How are you going to know where to go? In, you know, how do you know where to go in the Bible? Well, one, you go out and get some practice. But two, when you're reading on your own, you know, I'm always looking at verses and going, wow, this is a great verse to use when I'm trying to explain this topic or that topic or whatever. And you make note of it and you pay attention to it and you keep reading and then you get yourself more familiar with the Bible 
And, you know, there's so many reasons why we need to know this book. So many reasons why reading the Bible every day is important. That's how you're going to get it. Because you also don't want to forget. You don't want to lose it. You don't want to be a forgetful hearer. You don't want to hear something. But then you just, you know, you read the Bible for the week in one day. You learn something and then you go on the rest of your week. You're not even thinking about the things of God. That thing you learn is going to go in one ear and out the other. But if you're keeping it fresh and, and continuing to be in Scripture, that's going to keep your mind thinking on these things so that you're not going to be forgetful. Look at Romans chapter 11. You're in Romans 4. Look at Romans 11. We see more references just to, well, what does the Scripture say? Look at verse number 1. The Bible says, I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid, for I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew. You say, well, wait a minute, Pastor Bruce. I thought Jesus was just rebuking them for saying that the kingdom of heaven was taken from you and given to another people, bringing forth the fruits thereof. Yeah, that's true. But it doesn't mean what, what, what the Apostle Paul is saying here in Romans 11. He's saying is that God is not forsaken basically everybody that is a Jew. So even though he's taken the kingdom from them and given it to a nation, a nation bringing forth the fruits of, even though the nation of Israel as a nation is no longer going to be used by God in the capacity that it was before as God's chosen people, he's still showing that, well, God hasn't cast away just all of his people like they're all reprobate. He said, I'm a Jew. I'm an Israelite. I'm saved, right? The Apostle Paul was uh, the seed of Abraham. And then he goes back and says, um, he says, he didn't cast away his people. What ye not what the scripture saith of Elias, how he maketh intercession of God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed thy prophets and dig down thine altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. But what saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved to myself 7,000 men which have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. So even though Elijah thought that he was all alone, God tells him, no, it's not just you. There's still 7,000. There's still a remnant of Israel that believe. There's still some people that are my people. Even though it seems like Everybody has gone to the devil. Everybody's gone to Baal because that's what the people were worshiping, Baal worshipers in Elijah's day. They were worshiping Satan. And he thought everybody is just a Baal worshiper. He's like, I'm the only guy left that even believes in the Lord. They're all just cast away. They've all turned to idols. But God says, no, 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 it's not all. There is some. And that's what the Apostle Paul is he's referencing this passage because the Jews of Jesus' day, it seems like they all, I mean, every single one of them, it would seem like they all just rejected Christ. Why? Because they delivered up in general, right? The nation of Israel, the people of Israel delivered up Jesus Christ. But you know what? There's still a remnant that believed. And that's what he's explaining in verse 5. Even so then at this present time also there is a remnant according to the election of grace. There's still, a rem there's still some Jews that put their faith in God, in Jesus Christ. There are still some. They're not just completely gone. However, the nation of Israel was removed. The kingdom of, 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 was removed from the nation of Israel. The two are very compatible. When you're talking about individuals being saved versus an entire nation being the, the truth bearer and the standard bearer, two different things. And he, and he says, well, hey, didn't you read what the scripture says? Again, that's his answer. Verse no, or chapter number 15, Romans 15. Verse number three, the Bible reads, For even Christ pleased not himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproach thee fell on me, for whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. The scriptures, not only is it profitable as we saw in, in 2 Timothy chapter 3 where we started, uh, for, for instruction, for reproof, right, for, 
for correction, for all these things. The Bible says that these things, in, you know, Scripture is written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. Scriptures bring you comfort. The Scriptures bring you hope also. And that's another reason to be reading every day, to give you that extra hope, to bring you that comfort when you go through difficulties, when you go through tribulations, reading from God's word will help you through that. Unfortunately, a reaction that people oftentimes will have when they have hard times is to start rejecting the things of God. Things go bad and they say, oh man, now I don't even feel like going to church. I'm not going to read my, man, my day is just so bad. I'm not going to read my Bible today. You just kind of get in this real upset attitude where you don't just want to do anything at all. But if you just stop and realize, you know what, the scripture is actually going to give me hope and the scripture is going to comfort me. When you have those bad days, when you have those problems, when you have the serious trials or persecutions or whatever is going on, that's when you really need to be getting in the Bible. That's when you really need to make sure you're staying in church and not forsaking the assembly because that's when you need it most. And unfortunately, when people need the things of God most, it's usually the time when they're forsaking the things of God. And that's only going to perpetuate the problem. And it's only going to make things worse. You ever find yourself, and, I, and I'm going to continue, I'm going to preach this, I've preached this forever, and I'm going to continue to preach this for as long as I've been a preacher. You find yourself in a sin. One, confess and forsake that sin to God. And two, get back in church right away. Don't be ashamed and embarrassed to the point to where you say, well, I can't go to church now. Get right with God and get back in church. Amen. Don't worry. No one should ever have to worry about what people are going to think of you in church. And that's not the church we're going to have here. Not if I can help it. I don't want people looking down on others. Someone stumbles and falls. Someone gets themselves into, into a bad sin. We want them right with God. We're going to follow 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And if we need, if so need be, you know, we won't even sit down and eat with a wicked person that's an unrepentant sinner that's involved in some serious sin. We'll do that. We'll do that for their benefit. And that's the way we're going to operate here. However, on the flip side, when someone is repentant and someone is just like, man, you know, I shouldn't have done that. I feel, you know, you're going to be received. Yes, sin can be very embarrassing and shameful. I know. Okay, I'm a sinner too. I get it. But don't let that, don't let your pride get in the way of you just getting, you know, getting right with God and where you just continue down a bad path because you say, oh, well, I can't show my face now in church. You need to be in church. People here love you. You know, we're a church full of sinners. We're going to understand and be here for you. What we care about is that you're right with God. What we care about, hey, you're repentant. You, you want to do what's right? Come back. Stay in church. Don't just let yourself get out. And then it gets to the point, too, because, I, I, look, I've seen this over and over and over again so many times. People don't, they, for whatever reason, they're getting out of church. Usually it's because of sin. And then it's like, well, I haven't been to church now in a couple months. Now I can't not, I mean, now how am I going to go back? I mean, people are going to ask me, what I've, you know, don't fall into that trap. Don't, don't have so much pride that you have to worry about that. If you've already done wrong, get right with God. That's all that matters anyways. If someone's going to look at you differently, that's not, that, that you shouldn't be worried about that. The fear now a man can do what you don't think, what, fear what man can think of you. You know, fear God. Fear God and keep his commandments. This is the whole duty of man. Remember that it, when and if you ever get to that point to where maybe you're starting to backslide. Maybe you are, you, you are getting out. and you know, The last thing you should be thinking is, oh, well, I can't go back to church. Unless, unless you are just some unrepentant sinner, you just want to keep being a drunk. Then, yeah, you know what? You can't come back to church. But when you're right, when you're right with God, when, you, when you've confessed and forsaken, come back to church. We want you here. You need to be here. Turn 
Turn to Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17, I want to show you one more thing out of here, and then we're going to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and we'll be done. Trying to help you understand why it's so important to read the Bible. I mean, there's so many reasons why we need to have the Bible every day. It could go on and on and on and on and on, but I won't. I'll cut it short. We're not going to go on all day and all night preaching why the Bible is so important. I mean, this is so fundamental. But look at verse number 10 here in Acts chapter 17. The Bible says, And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word of God with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. So we have Paul and Silas go into Berea. They go into a synagogue. They start teaching the Bible. They start talking to the people there. They're teaching doctrines. They're teaching out of scriptures. And the people in Berea, because they just come from Thessalonica. Thessalonica, they weren't very well received. They had a lot of problem, people who were causing problems there. So they flee Thessalonica. They go to Berea. And, and the Bible refers to, the Holy Ghost is referring to the people of Berea, Berea being more noble. They're better. They're more noble than those in Thessalonica. Why? Because they, received, they were able to receive the word. And the reason why they received the word, they had the readiness of mind. Why? Because they were going to the scriptures and seeking the scriptures out daily. Because that's what their priority was. That's where their heart was. They cared more about what does the Bible actually say about this than what does my favorite preacher say about this? What does my denomination say about this? What does someone else say about this? That didn't matter as much. It doesn't matter that it's coming from Paul. It's what does the scripture say? I don't care if it's coming from an ex-Pharisee. I don't care who it's coming from. If, it's, if that's what the Bible says, then that's what I care about. It didn't come from their rabbi. It's coming from the apostle Paul. But they just said, hey, is that, is that what the scripture actually says? That's why they're more noble. And that's the attitude we need. We can receive the word of God. Your mind will be ready to learn and to receive truth when you're searching scriptures daily. When every day you're reading through God's word, you're going to be ready to receive those new truths, those things that you hear. You hear some preachers say, you're searching that scripture daily. You'll be able to turn, hey, well, those things really are so. Or no, that's not true. One way or the other. In Berea, obviously the apostle Paul was t preaching the truth. They received that. But then what happens? Verse number 12, it says, therefore, many of them believe. So a lot of people in the synagogue get saved. Why? Because they cared about the integrity of the scriptures. They, that's what mattered to them. Also, vulnerable women, which are of Greeks and of men, not a few. But look at verse number 13. But when the Jews of Thessalonica acknowledged that the word of God was preached of Paul at Berea, they came thither also and stirred up the people. It was the Jews, the Jews of Thessalonica specifically in this case, they didn't want the truth being preached. They're trying to shut down Paul. They're the ones that don't care about what the scripture says. They care about their own doctrine. They care about their own status. They care about someone, you know, calling them out or whatever. They don't care about the actual truth of the Bible. And what do they do? They're stirring up trouble. The people who don't have the proper emphasis just on what the scripture says are the ones that are going to be causing all the problems and stirring up the trouble. We ought to trust God's word. This ought to be, you know, and, and one of my favorite phrases is show me in the Bible. Someone comes at me with, with some doctrine or some, some teaching or some, you know, something contradictory to what I believe. Well, show me in the Bible. Because that's what's going to change my mind. If I'm wrong on something, if I'm in error on doctrine, it's going to be because I haven't read. I haven't understood. And I need you to show that to me. But show me from the Bible. I'm not going to trust you just because of some piece of archaeology or because you think you're some expert in some foreign language or some dead language. Look, I'm not going to trust you because of that. You need to show me from Scripture. Show me from the Bible why I'm wrong about something. And if I'm wrong, hey, 
I'll change. And then that's, and then, well, that's the attitude we ought to have. Don't get puffed up with pride. Oh, well, I, I, I heard of a, or I knew one time a family once that uh, they, they changed their belief. The, the, fam the, the head of the family changed his belief on the, the rapture, the timing of the rapture. He saw in the scriptures, wow, that's true. But then didn't want to tell his family and, and teach them different. And it's what they ended up not coming to church because he's like, well, I've been teaching this way for so long. I don't want them to not be able to trust what I tell them. And say, oh, well, if he was wrong about this, then what else is he wrong about, right? To, he, was th he felt threatened in his position. And you know what that tells me? He cares more about his position and his authority than he cares about the word of God. Because when you learn something's true, you need to humble yourself. And especially at that point, you say, well, what are you going to do? Teach your children a lie? Look, nobody's perfect. And how about you set the example for it to your children and then just literally say, hey, dad's not perfect. I was wrong about this. Be able to show them some humility, but then continue to show them the truth and say, I know I was wrong about this, but this is what's right and you need to know this and you need to understand this. And that's not going to, you know what it's going to do? It's going to give you more credibility. That's not going to make them all the, well, he's wrong about that and what else? You know, that's not, the, see, that's just a fearful thing to have. But if your kids hear that and they say, oh, wow, that's really interesting. I mean, there's, there's good reason why you believe the wrong way because you had someone teaching you the wrong way for your whole life. So it's not like it's just unreasonable. But see, th these are fears that people have when you're not willing to humble yourself and just accept the scripture for what it says. And just and, and even in this case, when he was understood that it was right, not allowing, not giving, not exalting God's word above everything. This needs to be exalted above everything, above your position, above whatever. You know, this is this is God's word, and we need to treat it as such. Last place I'll be turned. Look at First Corinthians chapter two. We'll read at the end of the passage here, verse number 12. Sorry, in verse number 12, the Bible reads, Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual, but the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. And again, this is another passage I could go in all kinds of different directions, but the 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 focus of this the the word of God is providing us um not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God. The Holy Spirit's going to guide you into all truth and knowledge. Um, we should be speaking these things, as he says here, not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But then look at verse number 16. It says, But who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Again, another epistle of Paul after the resurrection of Christ, Christ is no longer on this earth. He's no longer walking around. Yet he says, we have the mind of Christ. And we do have the mind of Christ because we have every word of God. We have the word of God at our disposal today. You want to know what the mind of Christ is? Read the scriptures. Read the Bible. There's a reason why Jesus Christ is known as the word. The Word of God. The Word was made flesh. We have the mind of Christ. And it's found in the Holy Scriptures. Let's exalt the Holy Scriptures in our life and give it its proper place. 
and give God the proper time in our life to hear from him. Hopefully you spend a lot of time asking God for things, but why don't you take some time to hear from God? It's one thing to ask, but he's, he gives us answers. You know, oftentimes I think people can have their own prayers answered for them if they would just read the Bible. You know what the answer is in certain situations. It's found here. You don't need to keep asking for them if you would just read. So January 1st begins our challenge. And the challenge is to read the entire New Testament in the month of January. It gives you 31 days to read the entire New Testament. If you were to keep up that pace of reading, I think, and again, I, I, don't quote me on the math because I haven't, I haven't done this in a while. I think you'd end up reading the Bible two and a half times in the course of the year. That's a lot of scripture being read. And if you can achieve that, you will grow leaps and bounds just by getting that much more Bible. And, and the key is going to be to work it into your schedule so you're not relying on doing the whole chunk in one sitting. Try to get that done at different times of the day, even if it's only twice, morning and evening. Right? Morning, afternoon, evening, whatever you could make work. You get that done, and, and I promise you, I promise you, you will, you will experience spiritual growth like you haven't seen before. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for providing us with, with this instruction that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Lord, these are your words, your words for us. As a loving creator, you've, you've given us what we need to know. Lord, help us to treat these words not just not with disdain or not flippantly, dear Lord, but that we would... And, and not just as something needs to be checked off a box, but that we would r love to desire the sincere milk of your word and the meat of your word and, and just to, to dig in and to, to see what you have for us and what you'll teach us, Lord. We ask for you to open up our understanding. Help us to, to take the proper time and set it aside to hear from you in our day-to-day -day life, Lord. And, and please just continue to, to bless our church and give us wisdom and knowledge. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.